First of all, thank you very much for voting for this uh, presentation. I wonder if I call it machine connectivity, if you would vote for it, but I use the IoT in purpose, so you'll vote for it. <laughs> thank you very much for that. Um, my name is Yosef Graziano. You can call me Yossi. This is how my friends call me. And I'm a CCIU wireless Woo! recently. Yeah, thank you very much. You can find me on Twitter. And I have my own company just down there called YNS Network Solutions. It's a consulting company. And we are focusing on industrial environment in Germany. This is what you do in Germany. You do industrial stuff. <laughs> All right. With angst. With angst. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So how many of you, just before we start, how many of you work in industrial environment or familiar with this picture or something similar? That's cool. All right. How many of you uh, work with Siemens devices or had worked with Siemens devices? Rami, put your hand down, please. <laughs> All right, and that guy. Good. So today we'll start with a small definition. What is IoT? I think I don't need to explain what IoT is because we all know what IoT is, but in industrial environment is a little bit different. Uh, IoT can be machines, basically. So, um, and we'll we'll try to understand why IoT industrial. Uh, what we do today as connectivity and IoT connectivity, the use cases, and maybe I will be having an outlook on where we're going. I don't promise anything, but this is a. I try to put it into two, or divide it into two different categories. We have Internet of Things, so we have the Internet, and we have the Things. And the Things is, can be anything. What you see here, it's an Intel device, it's a microcomputer. I got it from one customer, it's 2.4 gigahertz only, and they needed to connect it to certain displays to monitor machines. It's a small device. You can see things like automatic screwdrivers, if you are familiar with those ones. They have a small Wi-Fi module. They are really bad. Or you can see robotic arms in development. In this case, the robotic arm in a development phase, and we can have a saying. We can say, hey guys, take out this ASUS device over there and put some kind of uh, workroom bridge or a different Wi-Fi module. But sometimes it can be more fun and you have an automated forklift. Uh, you see that a lot in logistics today. And you can have this 20 by 5 meters uh, robot autonomously driving and need connectivity. All right. So IoT is not a, it's not a, it's not a new thing. So some of you have been doing this uh, uh, location tags over Wi-Fi. I think uh, Aeroscout, a few years ago, they used to do something like that. And uh, this was, no one called it IoT back then. We called it connected devices or tags or, or whatever. We had humidity sensors, Wi-Fi humidity sensors, temperature sensors. And in the production and the manufacturing facilities, they have also um, logistic handled, handheld devices, uh, they have a lot of monitors. So if you, if you go to industrial environment, the automation is there. Uh, they do it on wired. They have machine-to-machine -machine communication. And, out. and they need to move to the Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, everyone wants to produce more because we demand more. Uh, factories try to cut costs and to improve their efficiency. Uh, we see a lot of, uh, we call it uh, predictive and remote maintenance. So there's a lot of uh, AI and analytics. I'm trying to avoid using buzzwords. I'm really sorry, but I have to use it. So there's a lot of AI and analytics happening on the information we gather from machines uh, by monitoring the temperature of the machine <clears throat> and the cycle of the motors or uh, other parameters we can predict when, when the next maintenance cycle and plan it in advance. And also we need to reduce human-made errors. As we know in Wi-Fi, there's a lot of those. Okay, so it starts like a very good Wi-Fi design. You always start with good questions. 
You have to find the right questions to ask the customer and base, based on the answers, we start analyzing what kind of categories or what kind of use cases for IoT devices. I would say the major category is location and tracking. And you guys who work in manufacturing facilities, correct me if I'm wrong, everyone wants to know where the tools are, where the machines are, because we hear from customers that they spend a lot of time looking for tools. You have uh, this automated screw, gu screw gun or s screwdriver that you saw. They have 10 tools of those, and they are very expensive, so you need to move them from one to the other um, employee. And they spend a lot of hours, sometimes 10,000 hours or more every year just locating devices. And this is, at the end in manufacturing, this is a kind of um, cost a lot of money to send the people to do this localization stuff. The need to do monitoring on the tools and to manage the machines. Uh, naturally, these machines are wired connected, but when you need to move them, they try to find a wireless solution. Asset inventory and management. And this is also in, we see a lot of um, screws and parts that they have RF tags, they have um, the need or they have a box and they need to know where, how many boxes like those we have at certain time. It's more uh, inventory for manufacturing. And for sure, automation of work orders. So when I talk about more automation of work orders, this is why I ask the Siemens guys, um, because it's already happening. We know that uh, PLCs in the network are sending these automation work orders. and basically on the wired uh, side of the network. Um, yeah, uh, we have um, optimization for the whole process. This is a funny story because I work, I consult one of the customers and try to ask uh, the questions and they say they use a certain type of glue to, to, to connect two big parts together and this has to be, in a, has to be done in a certain time. And if you um, take two minutes more the glue will be uh, will heat up, and they can't put the parts together. It's I can't say what that is, but it's giant machines that they need to glue them together, and you have to do it in two minutes frame. So what's happening? They have a buffer where they put the glue, and another buffer where they put the other uh, part together. And if you have uh, overloaded in that buffer, they need to take this machine, take it out, and redo the processing. For sure, we have a lot of uh, reflection and a lot of uh, interesting environments that you see in, uh, in manufacturing. This is a pure metal bar. We try to do a Wi-Fi site survey in this case, case to provide sufficient coverage. Um, you, you see a lot of reflections and sometimes you can't expect, you see a coverage behavior that you can't expect it. Uh, in certain point, you have uh, variation of RSSI, a high variation of RSSI due to reflection. So first of all, we need to understand and we need to take care of sufficient coverage for all our IoT devices. And we see 2.4 and sometimes B clients. Yes, it is back. I, I know someone was talking about uh, 2.4 is hot for, for uh, for IoT devices, I agree, but I will say, I will show you later, there's other technologies we might need to start considering because anyways, this frequency is overloaded, overcrowded. Roaming and latency, this is, um, it's not valid for all the IoT devices. So IoT is, um, it's a group of devices. If we talk about um, using some industrial protocols, something like Profinet over Wi-Fi, we need to take care of uh, this roaming time and latency. And Andrew was talking about yesterday about, about uh, roaming in voice roaming. I think you have the same thing also in industrial clients, that they need to roam in a certain time. And if you are above 100 millisecond, the whole production line will stop. And they need to reconfigure everything. So we think that voice is really important. Sometimes you have things that you never think about because every time that they stop manufacturing, they lose money. 
IoT comes in many form factors. So we know um, can be Wi-Fi modules, can be Raspberry Pis or um, small PCBs. Sometimes we get a box, everything inside it, and two antennas. And this is your IoT device you need to connect it to your machine. One other consideration that we need to have a look at is security. How do you connect your Wi-Fi enabled IoT machine to the enterprise network or to the industrial network? What do you use? Most of them, they don't support TLS and certificates. And we found some of these devices, they support certificate as long as the chain certificate is with three certificates, like intermediate <coughs> device and CA. Uh, we can consider on the security um, identity PSK. Honestly, I didn't try any, to connect any device with identity PSK now. But yeah, industrial protocols that we need to take consideration also. If we work with Profinet, it's time sensitive and data rates. We love data rates. We disable everything below 24 megabit per second, sometimes 48 megabit per second. And I, I see sometimes configuration of controllers and they have one mandatory data rate, 48. That's it. So when you try to connect weak uh, or 802.11b devices, good luck with that. Battery life and ranch. I think the last three points are really, really important and they will be uh, what's taking the IoT into the next step from connectivity wise. Because we try to reduce uh, battery usage. Wi-Fi is not very battery conservative. So if we use Wi-Fi clients for IoT, we know that the batteries won't hold for long. And we try to get trench. We can do 50 meters, I don't know, it depends on the environment, but it's always meters. And we're looking for hundreds of meters coverage and even sometimes kilometers. Okay. This is a really, oops, sorry. Did I miss that? This is an AVG. It's an automated guided vehicle. This is a R2D2 style device. It takes, they call it something like that. They call it R2D2. Yeah. And this device basically helped the employees in the factory to take the toolbox from the calibration center to the working station in order to save the time that they're taking their bike, going there, it's 200, 300 meters away sometimes, and need to go, they need to switch these devices all the time between different employees. So you have a tablet, you click on it, and your box will arrive. It's really nice. You see the antenna first time and you say, all right, what's in it? If you are lucky, you will get some kind of uh, scalance. It's a Siemens, uh, Siemens access point that you can use it as a client. And I'm saying if you are lucky because you have, um, you can get with it a little bit more uh, fine tuning and optimization of the uh, rowing behavior. But sometimes you are not that lucky and you can get something like this. And this is a huge machine that you need. It's a crane environment and you need to connect that wirelessly because it need to run prof in it. So what you need in order to make it run you need a Wi-Fi client, I'll explain that. You need an alpha human who's telling the other what to do. And you can see this guy, he's really funny there, but he's telling everyone else what to do. And you need this mobile panel, which is a wireless connected Siemens mobile panel. I added the backside of this, uh, of this panel just to show you that there is no antenna. And the offset of this device is around 10 dBm offset from your normal laptop. So you walk next to the device, you do packet capture, and you see 10 dBm variation in the RSSI. Uh, yeah, we need to deal also with things like those. So what else out there? There's multiple technologies. That some, some of the people uh, talk about um, BLE today. Um, we have Zigbee, I'll go that way. We have BLE, Zigbee, Z-Wave, ISA 100 and Wireless Heart, 
for industrial uh, control, cellular base, and low power LP1 technologies. All of these technologies, I'm putting this out, these things that we are working, uh, we are testing, evaluating them recently to, in some cases, to replace the Wi-Fi clients. Because you don't always, you don't need always a high throughput. You send two Ks, small packets, small payload. You don't need to have all this association and uh, listen before talk and all what we know from the wireless uh, environment. Um, I would say Billy, as Wes said today, I think, Billy is more for location-based uh, applications. So when we have uh, use cases of location, natively, we evaluated a few technologies. So Billy is one of the leading technologies for location today. Although the implementation would be different, I think uh, most of them they will do, most of them they will do um, signal-based uh, BLE, so triangulation based on free space path loss. And um, there are some technologies on BLE that they use angle of arrival and time of flight, and you get way better accuracy using these uh, methods. ZigBee and Z-Wave, they are more used in home automation and home control. I have a lot of those inside my house, and you can connect them to a hub control everything. I will show you one of uh, the pictures I have. It's a Z-Wave device. Um, I didn't have a lot of experience beside reading about ISA 100 and wireless heart. Uh, they are not typical to our industry. But the big, coming, the big things coming are the cellular base and especially narrowband IoT and all the LP1 communication uh, and I will go through the LoRa and Sigfox today, just very short. I know it's a Wi-Fi conference, but I think we are allowed to talk about other stuff as well. All right. All right. So the LoRa is a low power wide area network. First of all, low power. We're talking about devices that can operate around nine to 10 years with a small battery. You send thousands of devices out. You don't want to end up replacing these uh, batteries all the time or sending people to do this job. So you need to rely on some kind of device that consume minimum power and maximum range. And we have the network side, and the network side is the connectivity. In this case, we see that uh, LoRa is defined as a, as, a, as a full stack of Simtech. So Simtech is, and some other companies are leading this uh, LoRa um, development program. So some companies join together to, to develop this technology. And basically, it's an ISM band in Europe, it's 868 megahertz. There's a lot of other applications on 868 megahertz. But in Europe, you can use 868 and 433 megahertz. And the nice thing about LoRa, they can uh, cover, they have a very large or very uh, high link budget. And they can cover uh, longer distance yeah, we know it depends on, on obstacles for sure, but you have a better coverage than Wi-Fi and other technologies so far. So the standard is um, the physical layer called LoRa, and as you see, the MAC layer, it's the LoRa WAN. And this is basically what controls the battery life and transmission. So, it's usually a start topology, so you have one device transmitting. There's no association in, in LoRa technology, there's no association. So the clients or the sensors are not associated to, to the gateways. So when the, when the sensor send a message, it can be picked up by few gateways. So we have uh, the end device, we have the gateway network, and all the smart or all the intelligence is at the network server. So everything will be calculated. If we 
apply some kind of uh, location services for outdoor environment on, on LoRa, the calculation of the location will be in the network server. The nice thing about it, you, it's very cheap. And because it's, very, very, it's even cheaper than 2.4 uh, chipsets, so you can develop a lot of things on, on top of it and in ISM band. There are some examples here. Yeah, just because of some NDAs, I really couldn't give a better resolution than that. Everything in development phase, so companies are trying to he keep the cards very close to their chest, and this is what we have. Some example of um, the one right at the end over there. This is Billy Beacons, and we arrange them on, on the floor based on the TX power. So we start with, I think, minus 20 dBm. Uh, sorry, we start with zero till to my, uh, minus 20 dBm TX power on each beacon. So those beacon pre-configured with a spe specific TX power, and we can use them for zoning, basically. But each one of those has a, um, a LoRa model in it. And when it picks the location, it's in this location, it will backhaul it to the, on the LoRa network. The device in the middle is, this is our site survey kit for LoRa and Sigfox. It's uh, very manual, so you go around, you record the value that you get there, you get uh, the spread factor, and you get the uh, RSSI, and you record it on, on a paper or something like that. We don't have tools to, to do uh, Ekehaus style site survey and validation surveys. So we have to do everything manually. And the ones over here, they, control, they have multiple technologies inside, so they use 2.4 for location, they use, um, they use time of flight to calculate the location, and they have sensor uh, for humidity, temperature, they have gyro and accelerometer. The one just here at the bottom of the of this picture is a 10 years battery. This one over here, it's two to three millimeters thick, I think, and has a battery for 10 years and operate on Z-Wave. This is a very basic door open, door closed sensor. There's a magnet and when they meet each other, it sends a message if the door open or door close. Yeah. The slide is still in work in progress, so, uh, I want to change all those uh, question mark with 42, but this is, <laughs> but I couldn't find your 42 if it was too late. Uh, but basically, basically this is a, a comparison table that I put all together to compare between different technologies. Uh, this helps me to decide what technology we're going to use for that device or for that use case, and I have also other tables that I use when I take these decisions. Um, yeah. On the LTE side, the, the interesting thing is uh, CAT-M LTE, uh, because with CAT-M you don't need to deploy, so it is low power, long range technology, but the good thing about it, companies are investing in this because you don't need to install additional infrastructure. With LoRa, you need to install the, or Sigfox, you need to use the network to use the gateways. With uh, LTE M, they use 200 uh, kilohertz free band in the current LTE, and they try to put this uh, kind of standard in, work, uh, in development now. Okay, oh, still have five minutes, but I'll try to summarize it that industrial IoT devices, they come in different ways, different form factors, and as we see, they can be very small devices or big machines. We have a lot of special consideration to deploy IoT on Wi-Fi, but other IoT devices, but we know that from Wi-Fi, we need always to ask the right questions and to try to analyze the answers. Always we need to think about coexistence between clients when you have IoT 2.4. And we need also to keep our mind open on emerging technologies. I know we, all, we do all Wi-Fi, but 
as consultant, when we consult other customers, you are the Wi-Fi guy, doesn't matter it's Wi-Fi, you need to consult for any wireless technology out there. So I get you will be familiar with some questions of those. And it's not always about throughput. When we send small messages, we don't need Wi-Fi for sending small messages. And the thing with voice, uh, we have the same things with, with Siemens devices. For 142 bytes, I don't need to be associated to, to Wi-Fi. And if this breaks, it, everything will break and the factory will stop working. So it's not always about throughput. And again, there's no one technology that will give you the answers of all IoT devices. Forget about it. I'm, I'm trying to search technologies the last half year and I couldn't find one technology, even for localization, what's good for indoor, what's good for enterprise, it's not good for manufacturing facilities. So keep it open and thank you very much. There are some references over here. Thank you very much.